Gordon Gee does it again. From the Battelle studio at WOSU at COSI, this is Columbus on the Record. Joining Mike Thompson this week, Joe Hallett, senior editor for the Columbus Dispatch. Julie Carr Smythe, State House correspondent for the Associated Press. Michael Miller, attorney and former Franklin County prosecutor. And Brian Rothenberg, director of Progress Ohio. When they erect a statue of Gordon Gee on the OSU campus, which they likely will at some point, the statue may be of a bow-tied president with his foot in his mouth. First, it was not wanting to play the Little Sisters of the Poor, then OSU employees were the Polish Army, then Jim Tressel was going to fire him. Now, another attempt at humor has gone astray when Guy complained about negotiating athletics with Notre Dame University. First of all, they're not very good partners. I'll just say that. I negotiated with them during my first term, and the fathers are holy on Sunday, and they're holy hell on the rest of the week. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, you just, can't tr you just can't trust those damn Catholics on a, on a, on a Thursday or Friday. And so, uh, so the, uh, 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 literally, I, I can say that. And in the same speech the, to the Ohio State Athletics Council, Guy jabbed the Southeastern Conference. Yeah, well, you tell the SEC when they can learn to read and write, then they can figure out what we're doing. Okay. Yeah, that's right. I've been down there. I've been down there. I was the chairman of the Southeastern Conference for two years. I tell you something, it is, it, it is, it's shameful. Joe Hallett, classic Gordon Gee, but is this Gordon being Gordon or is this something more serious now? Well, this is Gordon being Gordon on steroids. I mean, even by his standards, this is a, a cause for more seriousness. I mean, he, this tape, the tapes he just played were played endlessly on ESPN Thursday night. Uh, the trustees had to be cringing uh, all through the week as the coverage came out. Everybody knows, everybody who knows Gordon Gee likes him. I mean, he's a wonderful ambassador for the university. Uh, by any standard, he has uplifted the academics of the, of the university. But there are limits to how much the trustees are willing to take. And, and, in, and in their letter, the trustees do seem to be losing a bit of patience. They wrote a letter of uh, remediation. It's not a letter of reprimand, but remediation. The board says, should future instances take place, they would constitute cause for even more punitive action, including dismissal. So there you go, Joe, the D word. We haven't seen that before. Yeah, and, and it's unusual, unusual because nobody would ever dream that uh, a person with Gordon Gee's talents um, or his stature would be subject to dismissal. But it's gotten to this point. I fault the trustees a little bit here, too, because this incident, the speech happened in December. They sent him the letter of remediation early in March, and it takes until June for this to come out. Why didn't the trustees get in front, of the, in front of this, put it out on their terms, rather than have it leaked to the Associated Press, uh, and then everybody else to glom onto this? So is this, a, is this a, just a cumulative effect? I mean, this is, I mean, this is maybe a little worse than the ones you said in the past, but. I think it does start to, to look like a pattern, uh, and it has this taint of, of bigotry to it. You know, these aren't just jokes that are, you know, maybe a little off color, but they start to have a pattern when you're talking about religious or uh, uh, religious affiliation and that kind of thing. So, you know, it'll be interesting, as Joe says, you know, they reprimanded him in March, um, but never really came out with this, never made it anyone aware at a trustee meeting or, or in any kind of a formal way. And so, you know, it has to make its way through uh, through grapevines to us in the media that uh, this has happened and has offended quite a few people. Yeah. I mean, you know, culturally, I have to tell you, I, I think there's a real problem at Ohio State. Um, last fall, um, they took $10 million in our naming a new arena after uh, a donor named Cavelli. And Cavelli, uh, uh, through his company, had settled a lawsuit just pr the previous year over discrimination issues. And it was kind of tone deaf that you're just ignoring the fact that this donor had had this settlement over a discrimination issue and you're spending this money. So I don't think it's just Gordon Gee. I just think there's an insensitivity there at the university, and that rises to the trustee level. I think you're right, Joe. Michael, I mean, you're a proud Buckeye, um, Buckeye fan. He's joking here. 
Yeah, I think he is. I, I think it's an attempt to uh, say something humorous that in the age we live in isn't very funny. It just doesn't go over well. People are very sensitive now. I think sometimes way too sensitive, but that's the way it is. That's the life, uh, the uh, era, era we're living right now. But he's done it repeatedly, and uh, it, it just, it also, it seems like it's sort of lighthearted, and he wants to say something that he thinks is going to be funny, and it doesn't come off. I thought the thing with Trestle, which was a little bit different, uh, of course, but I thought it made everybody look bad. It just looked like almost buffoonery out there making comments like that. And I know he did it lightheartedly, and I agree with Joe. He's done a great job, and he's well-respected, but... Uh, he, he's really put his foot in his mouth recently. Well, and it should be noted, this was not a YouTube gotcha moment. This was not where it happens all the time. People say something and suddenly it goes viral. This was not that. This was a meeting that was known about, that the taping was known about, that was before a, a distinguished board in his official capacity. There was no, it wasn't a gotcha moment. And so that makes it to me a little bit different and more distinctive. Well, I've heard a lot this week is, you know, that is just, that's who he is. He's off the cuff, and that's what we like about him, that he is willing to, you know, say things that are funny, that are a little bit off color, a little bit, you know, not politically correct. Is there a danger? That the trustees, Joe, they want him to limit his appearances. They, they ask him to consider limiting his appearances. Is that the direction to, to bottle him up, to tie him down? I think that's a mistake because he can be so effective for the university and is such a dynamic, likable personality. Uh, but, you know, there, this, these are things my buddies and I might uh, say some crazy things on fishing trips, but we don't do it in front of, you know, public audiences and something. And, and it's all in good natured fun. And I think that's probably the way Dr. Gee um, sell all of this stuff. But I have talked to him in the, in the political context a number of times particularly when Mitt Romney became, rose up to become a, the presidential candidate. Dr. Gee, as you know, is a Mormon, mm -hmm. and he is sensitive to the, you know, to some of the unkind things said about Mormons. So for him to, you know, in turn say things about Catholics, even in a joking way, it just, uh, I would ex expect more than that from him. But, you know, Governor Kasich responded to this, who's a very off-the-cuff person known to put his foot in his mouth. And he said something which we've heard him say before, you know, do you want human beings or do you want robots? And I think that there is a refreshing nature to those kind of leaders right now because so many people never move off their script. They're just, they're, they'll say the same thing over and over again to a reporter because it's on their script and, and there aren't, there's a lot of plastic, um, personas out there, and so I think that that is why they succeed, but I think they have to do it within the limits of reason. There's Gordon Gee on steroids, and then there's talking points on steroids, and we've had a lot of the talking points, you know, over and over and over again. We get tired of those, too. Anyway, our next topic, Democrats are calling Republican lawmakers bad names after they quickly copied and pasted a provision onto a bill that makes Jobs Ohio virtually audit-proof, at least as, the, as far as the state auditor is concerned. You'll recall... Auditor Dave Yost demanded to examine Jobs Ohio's books. He maintains the quasi-private development agency is supported by public money. The governor balked. Eventually, he gave in. But now, that provision approved by the House and the Senate legally prevents the auditor from looking at all of Jobs Ohio's books. Uh, I think this is a fair balance, a fair compromise, and it, it allows us to move forward on, on that program while maintaining what we all believe in, and that's transparency. Brian Rutherberg, you're suing over this Jobs Ohio thing. You agree with the whole transparency remark there? Well, I, I think the whole thing is set up to avoid transparency. I think that's what the governor wanted, and that's what he set up here. I, I, you know, what's really shocking in this day and age is that it was introduced on Wednesday at noon. It passed committee. It passed the House that day. It passed the Senate the next day in record time with the s Republican auditor saying very loud and clearly, we don't want this to pass. Yet they pass it. And, um, it, you know, the Cleveland Plain Dealer said today that action alone raises questions and red flags about this in their editorial. And uh, so I don't think it's just me. I think that, that there are a lot of people in the state of Ohio right now that are left to wonder what is really going on 
and why do they really have to shut down all these records? They talked about, during the, the height of the Yoast versus Kesa controversy, they talked about changing state law. Um, so it wasn't terribly surprising that this happened, it just it was the suddenness of it. Why was it so quick to come about? That, I, I honestly don't know why they moved so quickly, because I think that is a piece of what looks bad about it. I think had they had a, a week of, of committee meetings on it and all this came out. But, you know, they're kind of in lockstep right now with Kasich over at the State House, and um, it was clearly something the administration wanted. Um, the Yoast uh, is Republican, as Brian points out, and has legitimately said, you know, I uh, feel that I have this this ability to see the private side of the books. You know, the public side is already volunteered to him mm -hmm. with no problem, and he has he has said that he legitimately has that ability. Um, he's a Republican. The Democrats are also upset about it. We've seen in other states that try to set up these sort of things that they get really, um, they can have a difficulty with accountability because who can follow the money and see if they're making jobs? Here's the the, pro the the crux of this is the state is leasing the liquor sales profits, you know, worth hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, um, and that's now private money, even though for years, for decades, it was public money. So that's what Dave Yost is arguing. It was public money, is public money, and should be accountable. But the case of the administration says, Michael, that you know, we can't do business, we can't, because companies don't want to deal in the public sphere. Well, that's right, and I don't know that I've ever had a lease like this in the past to turn what was public money into private money. I know Brian disagrees with that, and that's the theory. And I, I think the auditor, too, early on said something that he felt <clears throat> he had the, uh, the ability to reach into any entity that used public money into the private side, although he wouldn't do it, mm -hmm. going into the private side. And I think that was a, a concern to a lot of people. You know, I have a high regard for Governor Casey's ethics, but I think he ill-advisedly cut out the one person who could really prevent a scandal from blowing up at Jobs Ohio, because I've always felt the way this is structured, it's just a scandal waiting to happen. I mean, we've got a hundred million dollars annually in taxpayer money. Uh, we have little accountability. We have businesses and corporations and their lobbyists lining up with their hands out. And we have a governor who's going to have to raise 20 million plus for re-election. Those are combustible items all wrapped up in Jobs Ohio. I trust Governor Casey to do the right thing. But, you know, you have a lot of friends around you when you're governor who can get you into trouble. And uh, He argues that there is an independent audit and then all of the, the expenses will be made with public after the deals are done for the ones that succeed. The question is, what about the deals that don't succeed and we, don't, we will, may not see well, those? Well, and I mean, they, they have a legitimate argument that deals, business deals before they are sealed have never been public, uh, and, th and they shouldn't be. I mean, you have to be able to negotiate those sort of deals. I think where this one, as Mike points out, got um, concerning to folks is that he was going to be able to go in if he was going to be able to go in and look at the private books of all kinds of private entities that do public business. Um, I just, I'm not sure that we knew for sure whether that was going to be happening. I mean, but I do know Cleveland Clinic, uh, OSU, and uh, a lot of the companies that are privatizing, they don't want to run yeah. that risk. Is this ultimately going to have to be settled through either Progress Ohio's lawsuit or another lawsuit? This really sounds like it needs to be settled well, by a court. It probably will be through Brian's lawsuit. Uh, and I might add also, I think the, uh, the Cuyahoga Cam uh, Chamber of Commerce also supported this. There's a lot of people who supported this. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's really a black and white you know, Republican, Democrat issue and so forth. But Brian's got a suit. I suppose he can answer that better than any of us. Well, I hope so. I mean, we got to get through the standing argument and actually have a court actually rule on whether it's constitutional. I believe it's unconstitutional. But what I can tell you is, you know, I mean, it's, it's I'm sure Joe and, and uh, Julie get a chuckle out, out of the fact that, you know, I've got Maurice Thompson from 1851 arguing this case. A Tea Party uh, group. The Tea yeah. Party group. I've got, you know, the Ohio Roundtable conservative group that signed an amicus. I mean, the concern here is not just right or left. The concern here is about how you have accountability with state money. And what it really boils down to here is, will we know that if we give a dollar for a job, a job is created? Or will we have to take the word of the company that creates the job and the governor that gets probably a campaign court contribution potentially from that company? And I think you're right, Joe. That's a very combustible problem. But is it fair for Democrats to 
allege through slogans or innuendo or supposition that it's already a, cor a corruption happening right now when there's been no real proof of that happening. I think it's a, a the, the problem there right now is is um, you know and politicizing it you know I, I don't know I mean I've got right groups with me on this so it's kind of awkward sometimes when the party enters into it but what I will tell you is that the fact that uh, that nobody knows just leaves it open for somebody to raise those <coughs> issues. But there is a long list of things that Jobs Ohio does have to report. Um, one of my problems covering it, because uh, having covered business and government for a long time, is that the business cycle in which a nonprofit files is so out of sync with the news timing of things. So you don't find things out for th three months oftentimes, sometimes a year, it depends. If you're only doing an annual report and then you wait till March to get it, you know, then we, then you can't really put these things together and, and put the pieces together in a timely way. All right, our next topic, Governor Kasich's tax cut plan had three legs, a cut in the sales tax, a cut in the income tax, and a cut for small businesses. The House only kept part of the income tax cut. Now the Senate only wants the business tax cut. The Senate plan does not include the income tax cut for everyone. Julie Carr-Smythe, why did the Senate only pick the small business tax reduction? I think there are two reasons. One is that they don't have the money to pay for both uh, without taking the Medicaid expansion uh, and accepting that, which Kasich's plan had. Uh, that saved a lot of money. They don't have the money to do both. Uh, in terms of the superiority of it, I think they see it as more targeted to what they call job creators, where a statewide income tax would be more um, across the board. We did one of these recently, a 4.2%. We did a, a slow phase in 21% over years, and certain surveys said nobody even noticed. Yeah. So they think it'll be much more uh, effective if you give it to small businesses. I don't know. I, I, you know, the tax cuts are the holy grail of the Republican Party, and I get that. And of course, we're going into an election year, and they want to be able to say that we cut taxes for Ohioans and Ohio businesses. I, but I really question the need for this. Um, the the budget does. The Senate Republicans are going to allocate more for education, but there's still a lot of local governments that could use money. Um, and schools who could use more money. And uh, we've seen national studies that show 80% of small businesses employ just one person. So, and a lot of, and we've seen studies by, uh, by Ohio groups that show that uh, a lot of these uh, businesses, which might receive a tax credit, uh, really don't intend to expand. A lot of those small businesses, Mike, are attorney's offices, legal offices. Is this going to help them hire another, you know, legal aid or receptionist or even another attorney? Well, I suppose in the right case it could, uh, and, and in many cases it won't have any effect at all. Uh, but I do think this, that uh, as Joe points out, he may have some problems with this, but we all know some better than others, Governor Kasich. And he said this when he ran uh, uh, in uh, 2010. Uh, he was going to have taxes cut. He was going to have the taxes cut for individuals and so forth. And rightly or wrongly, I think he's going to do it. When he makes up his mind to do something, he does it. And I think we'll see something like that along the lines of before the election in 2014. Well, so, so, you know, 80%, by the way, the 80% of the people that get this small business tax cut are going to get about at $400 a year. It's it, how do you create a job on four hundred dollars a year? This is this this is a talking point, and it seems to me it's about elections, and it's not really about good public policy. Um, and I think that's part of the problem with our tax code in this state is that we make these decisions uh, based on election cycles and what what works in a poll. Well, and I was going to say, and had said on the earlier topic that they're triangulating between the House, the Senate, and the governor's office. It seems, and so they each wanted to do something that was popular. Um, in, in my view, if Kasich can't deliver on this income tax, um, he promised it when he comes around four years later and hasn't done it, when he hasn't gotten the Medicaid expansion and he hasn't gotten the oil and gas <coughs> cut uh, tax uh, hike that yeah. he wanted to have, it's not gonna be a successful uh, budget season for him. But I think what we'll see is that they will marry these two in some way in, uh, in the conference committee and, and he'll get a little bit of victory uh, on both sides. I mean, the good news is that 
we can talk about tax cuts because Ohio's economy has rebounded so strongly. And that's what the election is going to be about next year. Governor yeah. Kasich is going to claim credit for creating 130,000 more jobs since he became governor. Did he? That's what the campaign will be about, but certainly it won't hurt him going into this. And to be able to say that not only did I create jobs, I cut taxes at the same time makes a strong argument for his reelection. Well, it'll be hard to know whether he did or not because we won't know because of Jobs Ohio. But what I can tell you, <laughs> what I can tell you is that we are having a bad year when it comes to some of the indicators in the economy, which is a little concerning. Um, we had some slow months here, and sometimes doing these tax cuts actually doesn't stimulate things, and we so might So the need Obama recovery slowing down yeah, now? Yeah, I don't, uh, you know. <laughs> but what I will say is I, I, I think we might miss some of this revenue that we're just giving away just to try to win some political points. All right, let's get to our last topic. Supporters of gay rights are trying again to get an anti-discrimination bill through the Ohio legislature. The bill would ban discrimination based on sexual orientation. Similar bills have failed in the past, but with gay rights gaining greater acceptance, these bills now perhaps have a better chance of winning approval. Mike Miller, you're a longtime conservative. How do you see this debate from where it was 10, 20 years ago to where it is now, the, the, addition, the debate over gay rights and anti-discrimination and even marriage? Well, I think anybody knows it's absolutely night and day. I mean, it has been a turnaround of close to 180 percent it's just incredible or degrees um i think it, it's going to pass uh i saw the most recent poll i saw i think was 79 percent something like that high percentage of people in favor of it uh i think legislators read that i see the bills are introduced uh, bipartisan uh, republicans and democrats and uh, i think it's become a political uh Football, so to speak, but a good football vote-wise, and I, I think we're going to see something where I would have never dreamed something like this of happening 15 or 20 years ago. But times change, and uh, this is it, and I, I just don't think there's any doubt we're going to see it. Is it easier to pass for a conservative Republican to pass an anti-discrimination bill involving sexual orientation than it is to support gay marriage? Oh, I think no question it's easier, much easier. And I think the polls also show that. The gay marriage thing is uh, the slightly in favor, I want to say, 48, 44, or something, you know, it's relatively close. The discrimination thing is a whole different uh, set of figures. But so I think, I think it's much easier. I think, uh, you know, Governor Casey has, uh, to my knowledge, uh, embraced anti-discrimination. Uh, but still, the election uh, next year likely will be uh, played out on this issue in part, on gay marriage in part, because uh, the governor still opposes gay marriage. Uh, his likely opponent, Democrat Ed Fitzgerald supports it, came out in favor of it last week. Uh, very likely we'll have a, an amendment on the ballot in 2014 to overturn the 2004 ban, constitutional ban on gay marriage. So this is going to be a hot topic next year. You know, I, obviously uh, uh, we're part of the, the, the marriage um, uh, amendment process, but I'm also working with Equality Ohio on this legislation. And I, I got to tell you, just in the last four years, I think it's different. I've had some discussions with some conservative groups. I think they're open on the discrimination side of it. Um, some of you might have seen that um, I actually had given a, a talk and sent out an email about um, that it was legal to be fired in Ohio, and I actually got a call from a reporter at the plane dealer that didn't even realize that, and they made it into a politifact. Um, I think people just don't even know that you can be fired in this day and age for being gay, uh, that people like I can be fired, and I think it shocks them. And um, I think that, that that day is coming very quickly where that's going to change. The ballot issue, I think you're going to see um, more states passing it. I think Illinois is about to vote on it again. Um, and I, I think that it's inevitable that Ohio is going to get there, whether it's through this ballot issue next year or through in a couple of years. Julie, any chance that the governor changes his position on this? Or I don't want you to make a prediction, but well, I mean, we've heard rumors that a high-profile Republican may also join Rob Portman in changing his position. I don't know. Um, I'm not aware of that, but I do. I was going to say that I think the legislature, in a bipartisan manner, getting on top of something will get out in front of all that we're talking about here, all of the sort of public, um, uh, I guess, momentum that yeah. seems to be going on for this. And it'll show that they're at least open to l changing their opinion. And uh, it's something that got criticism to, for the Republican Party from the Tea Party group that tried to take over recently. Yeah. 
but okay. I think. Got to get to our off-the-record parting shots, and Brian, we'll start with you. You know, there's this provision that's in the budget that I hope doesn't get through that just says that if you don't pay your cable bill, they can shut you down in 14 days, not 45 days. These are the little things in the budget that really get to people out there, and I'm hoping that this helps bring a little attention And that's to serious it. when they got to cut your cable. <laughs> that's true. Michael. I think, as Julie said earlier, what you're going to see, the, the tax cuts for businesses were like $1.6 million. If they gave them to the individuals, it would be $1.5. They can't do both. I think they'll merge them and end up maybe uh, $800 million or something like that to each side. And no hikes. No hikes. <laughs> Julie. I don't think the Gordon Gee controversy is over yet. I think um, he won't be able to help himself. He talks pretty much 24-7. And Joe. Uh, I want to red flag a, a potential upset special in next year's statewide elections, and that is in the state treasurer's race. State Representative Connie uh, Pillage from Cincinnati uh, is likely to get the Democratic nomination. Uh, a, re a Democrat who's popular in a red area like Cincinnati is always formidable. She can match John Josh Mandel's military record. The only question is, can she match his fundraising? All right. My off-the-record comment, of course, they're really cracking down on cell phone cameras at the Memorial Golf Tournament this weekend because it's very distracting to the golfers. I think we should be able to heckle golfers. If LeBron James has to make a free throw with people screaming at him, Tiger Woods should have to make a six-foot putt with us screaming at him, too. That is Columbus on the Record for this week. Check us out online. Continue the discussion on Twitter and Facebook and streaming video at our website, WOSU.org. I'm Mike Thompson. Have a good week.